On Murder, Considered as One of the Fine Arts Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, June 2007 Miscellaneous Essays by Thomas De Quincey Section 2 on Murder Considered as One of the Fine Arts, Part 1. To the Editors of Blackwood's Magazine. Sir, we have all heard of a Society for the Promotion of Vice, of the Hellfire Club, etc. At Brighton, I think it was, that a society was formed for the suppression of virtue. That society was itself suppressed, but I am sorry to say that another exists in London, of a character still more atrocious. In tendency, it may be denominated a society for the encouragement of murder, but according to their own delicate, Greek euphemisios, it is styled the Society of Connoisseurs in Murder. They profess to be curious in homicide, amateurs and dilettanti in the various modes of bloodshed, and, in short, murder fanciers. Every fresh atrocity of that class, which the police annals of Europe bring up, they meet and criticize, as they would a picture, statue, or other work of art. But I need not trouble myself with any attempt to describe the spirit of the proceedings, as you will collect that much better from one of the monthly lectures read before the Society last year. This has fallen into my hands accidentally, in spite of all the vigilance exercised to keep their transactions from the public eye. The publication of it will alarm them, and my purpose is that it should. For I would much rather put them down quietly, by an appeal to public opinion through you, than by such an exposure of names as would follow an appeal to Bow Street, which last appeal, however, if this should fail, I must positively resort to. For it is scandalous that such things should go on in a Christian land. Even in a heathen land, the toleration of murder was felt by a Christian writer to be the most crying reproach of the public morals. This writer was lactantious, and with his words, as singularly applicable to the present occasion, I shall conclude, quote, Quid tam horrible, end quote, says he, tam tetram quam homus truncatido, idio severissimus legibilis vida nostra munitor, idiobella excribilia sunt, in vanit, Tamo consuedo quat netis homicidium, sinibello ac sin legibit faciat, et hoc sibi voluptuus quad sinsit vindicavit, quod si interes homicidio scleris consia est, et anum facionere spectator obstricitus, et qui admissor, ergo en is gladiatorium que debilis non meteor cru profunditur quit spectat, cam il quit facit, nec posse il immunis sanguin quil vetcit effunde, at videri non interfessis qui interfectori et favet a proemium post la vid. Quote, Human life, end quote, says he, quote, is guarded by laws of the utmost rigor, yet custom has devised a mode of evading them in behalf of murder, and the demands of taste, quote, voluptus, end quote, are now becoming the same as those of abandoned guilt, end quote. Let the Society of Gentlemen Amateurs consider this and let me call their especial attention to the last sentence, which is so weighty, that I shall attempt to convey it in English. Quote, now, if merely to be present at a murder fastens on a man the character of an accomplice, if barely to be a spectator involves us in one common guilt with the perpetrator, it follows of necessity that, in these murders of the amphitheater, the hand which inflicts the fatal blow is not more deeply imbrued in blood than he who sits and looks on, Neither can he be clear of blood who has countenanced its shedding, nor that man seem other than a participator in murder who gives his applause to the murderer and calls for prizes in his behalf. End quote. The quote, premier post levite. End quote. I have not yet heard charged upon the gentlemen amateurs of London, though undoubtedly the proceedings tend to that. But the quote, infetatore faville end quote, is implied in the very title of this association and expressed in every line of the lecture which I send you. I am, etc., X, Y, Z. Lecture Gentlemen, 
I have had the honor to be appointed by your committee to the trying task of reading the Williams Lecture on Murder, considered as one of the fine arts, a task which might be easy enough three or four centuries ago, when the art was little understood, and few great models had been exhibited. But in this age, when masterpieces of excellence have been executed by professional men, it must be evident that in the style of criticism applied to them, the public will look for something of a corresponding improvement. Practice and theory must advance pari passu. People begin to see that something more goes to the composition of a fine murder than two blockheads to kill and be killed, a knife, a purse, and a dark lane. Design, gentlemen, grouping, light and shade, poetry, sentiment, are now deemed indispensable attempts of this nature. Mr. Williams has exalted the idea of murder to us all, and to me, therefore, in particular, has deepened the arduousness of my task. Like Aeschylus or Milton in poetry, like Michelangelo in painting, he has carried his art to a point of colossal sublimity, and, as Mr. Wordsworth observes, has in a manner, quote, created the taste by which he is to be enjoyed, end quote. To sketch the history of the art, and to examine its principles critically, now remains as a duty for the connoisseur, and for judges of quite another stamp from His Majesty's Judges of Assisi. Before I begin, let me say a word or two to certain prigs who affect to speak of our society as if it were in some degree immoral in its tendency. Immoral. God bless my soul, gentlemen, what is it that people mean? I am for morality, and always shall be and for virtue and all that, and I do affirm and always shall, friends, let what will come of it, close friends, that murder is an improper line of conduct, highly improper, and I do not stick to assert that any man who deals in murder must have very incorrect ways of thinking, and truly inaccurate principles, and so far from aiding and abetting him by pointing out his victim's hiding place, as a great moralist of Germany declared it to be every good man's duty to do, I would subscribe one shilling and sixpence to have him apprehended, which is more by eighteen pence than the most eminent moralist have subscribed for that purpose. Footnote. Kant, who carried his demands of unconditional veracity to so extravagant a length as to affirm that if a man were to see an innocent person escape from a murderer, it would be his duty, on being questioned by the murderer, to tell the truth and to point out the retreat of the innocent person, under any certainty of causing murder lest this doctrine should be supposed to have escaped him in any heat of dispute on being taxed with it by a celebrated french writer he solemnly reaffirmed it with his reasons End footnote. but what then everything in this world has two handles murder for instance may be laid hold of by its moral handle parens, as it generally is in the pulpit and at the old bailey and, parens, and that i confess is its weak side or it may also be treated aesthetically, as the Germans call it, that is, in relation to good taste. To illustrate this, I will urge the authority of three eminent persons, that is, S. D. Coleridge, Aristotle, and Mr. Howship the Surgeon. To begin with S. T. C. One night, many years ago, I was drinking tea with him in Berners Street. Prince, which, by the way, for a short street, has been uncommonly fruitful in men of genius. Close Prince. Others were there beside myself, and amidst some carnal considerations of tea and toast, we were all imbibing a dissertation on Platonius from the Attic lips of STC. Suddenly a cry arose of fire, fire, upon which all of us, master and disciples, Plato and Hoi Periton Platona, rushed out eager for the spectacle. The fire was in Oxford Street at a pianoforte maker's, and, as it promised to be a conflagration of merit, I was sorry that my engagements forced me away from Mr. Coleridge's party before matters were come to a crisis. Some days after, meeting with my platonic host, I reminded him of the case and begged to know how that very promising exhibition had terminated. Oh, sir, said he, it turned out so ill that we damned it unanimously. Now does any man suppose that Mr. Coleridge who for all he is too fat to be a person of active virtue, is undoubtedly a worthy Christian, that this good STC, I say, was an incendiary, or capable of wishing any ill to the poor man and his pianofortes, many of them doubtless with the additional keys? On the contrary, I know him to be that sort of man, that I durst stake my life upon it, that he would have worked an engine in a case of necessity, 
although rather the fattest for such fiery trials of his virtue. But how stood the case? Virtue was in no request. On the arrival of the fire engines, morality had devolved wholly on the insurance office. This being the case, he had a right to gratify his taste. He had left his tea. Was he to have nothing in return? I contend that the most virtuous man, under the premises stated, was entitled to make a luxury of the fire, and to hiss it, as he would any other performance that raised expectations in the public mind, which afterwards it disappointed. Again, to cite another great authority, what says the Stargerite? He, in the fifth book, I think it is, of his metaphysics, described what he calls a perfect thief, and, as to Mr. Howship, in a work on his own indigestion, he makes no scruple to talk with admiration of a certain ulcer which he had seen which he styles, quote, a beautiful ulcer. Now will any man pretend that, abstractly considered, a thief could appear to Aristotle a perfect character, or that Mr. Howship could be enamored of an ulcer? Aristotle, it is well known, was himself so very moral a character that, not content with writing his Nicomachean Ethics, in one volume octavo he also wrote another system, called Magna Moralia, or Big Ethics. Now it is impossible that a man who composes any ethics at all, big or little, should admire a thief per se, and, as to Mr. Howship, it is well known that he makes war upon all ulcers, and, without suffering himself to be seduced by their charms, endeavors to banish them from the country of Middlesex. But the truth is that, however objectionable per se, yet, relatively to others of their class, both a thief and an ulcer may have infinite degrees of merit. They are both imperfections, it is true, but to be imperfect, being their essence, the very greatness of their imperfection becomes their perfection. Spartam noctis et hunc exorna. A thief like Autolycus or Mr. Barrington, and a grim, phagedanic ulcer, superbly defined and running regularly through all its natural stages, may low less justly be regarded as ideals after their kind than the most faultless moss rose amongst flowers, in its progress from bud to bright consummate flower, or, amongst human flowers, the most magnificent young female apparelled in the pomp of womanhood. And thus, not only the ideal of an inkstand may be imagined, as Mr. Collins demonstrated in his celebrated correspondence with Mr. Blackwood, in which, by the way, there was not so much, because an inkstand is a laudable sort of thing, and a valuable member of society, but even imperfection itself may have its ideal or perfect state. Really, gentlemen, I beg pardon for so much philosophy at one time, and now let me apply it. When a murder is in the palo post futurum tense, and rumor of it comes to our ears, by all means let us treat it morally. But suppose it over and done. Suppose the poor murdered man to be out of his pain, and the rascal that did it off like a shot. Nobody knows whither. Suppose, lastly, that we have done our best by putting out our legs to trip up the fellow in his flight, but all to no purpose. Albiti vasif, etc. Why, then, I say, what's the use of any more virtue? Enough has been given to morality. Now comes the turn of taste in the fine arts. A sad thing it was, no doubt, very sad, but we can't mend it. Therefore, let us make the best of a bad matter, and, as it is impossible to hammer anything out of it for moral purposes, let us treat it aesthetically, and see if it will turn to account in that way. Such is the logic of a sensible man. And what follows? We dry up our tears, and have the satisfaction, perhaps, to discover a transaction which, morally considered, was shocking, and without a leg to stand upon when tried by the principles of taste, turns out to be a very meritorious performance. Thus all the world is pleased, the old proverb is justified, that it is an ill wind which blows nobody good. The amateur, from looking bilious and sulky, by too close an attention to virtue, begins to pick up his crumbs, and general hilarity prevails. Virtue has had her day and henceforth virtu and connoisseurship have leave to provide for themselves. Upon this principle, gentlemen, I propose to guide your studies, from Cain to Mr. Thurtle. Through this great gallery of murder, therefore, together, let us wander hand in hand in delighted admiration, while I endeavor to point your attention to the objects of profitable criticism. End of Part 1 On Murder Considered as One of the Fine Arts 
from miscellaneous essays by thomas de quincey